I'm Andy Nidell, and this is a Great War live stream special together with Othias from Sea and Arsenal about British handguns of the First World War. For handguns, when we talk about Britain, their standard cartridge is going to be uh, 455. As a matter of fact, I have some examples here to show you. So let's just talk about cartridges first. Um, Britain had done like the United States and gotten interested in having what was called a man stopper cartridge. So uh, just if you guys can see this, we've got 45 ACP. And then on the far side, we have our British 455. This is not original ammo. This is a, a reload, modern reload. This is a modern reload as well. This is actually World War II. So um, they have a somewhat less powerful, but still equally fat cartridge as the US 45 ACP. And they're really obsessed with having a sort of large bore handgun that harkens back to the black powder era and is used for sort of knocking down opponents. Now, when they move over to a semi-automatic handgun, as we're gonna see in a moment, they'll keep that same diameter, give it a little more oomph, and go to a semi-rimmed pattern, just so that you can see that ammo. And for comparison, uh, that's nine millimeter. So these are hefty little pistol cartridges. Now, let me get these out of the way, and I'll bring out our first piece. We're gonna skip down the Webley Heritage. This is the Webley Top Brake Revolver Mark V. Uh, if we zoom in on this one, we can get a better look. Now, uh, first things first, I will say this one has been converted later on for import sales in America. What they did is they shaved the back of the cylinder so that they could fit the 45 ACP cartridge in it. I would not recommend firing standard commercial 45 ACP out of one of these guys, though, because they are rated for a milder 455 Webley. But these handguns are basically cousins to the US Schofield with some significant improvements. They're double single action with a lever top brake, so you press and release. At the, when you release, you're gonna simultaneously eject all of your cartridges. Later on in the war, uh, you would see things like uh, fast loaders like the Perdot loader. Um, those really weren't as prevalent as people would wish they were. Generally, you were stuck single loading, but at least you got to kick everything out at once. A uh, significant improvement over some of the revolvers we've seen so far. Now, uh, in this gun, again, we've explained this before, but double single means that I can either manually cock the hammer and then pull the trigger to drop it, or I can pull the trigger all the way through and just fire the next cylinder. Now, uh, these guys with the Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, Mark V, you see little improvements. Uh, strengthening of the action, uh, widening of the cylinder, that sort of thing. We're gonna work up a whole episode on what makes this different from an earlier model. But for the most part, from the Mark II to the Mark V, you're seeing this sort of medium to long barrel and this sort of bird's beak grip, this nice round shape. Uh, this is good for drawing. A lot of people were comfortable with this grip back in the day, especially for single-handed shooting. But when we get into the war, you're gonna see this gun get a little bit of an upgrade. So this would have been standard issue as the war started. Uh, it doesn't mean that there were a ton of them though, because just as it was being introduced, you have the war kick off very shortly after. There's already a lot of the older models laying around who look almost identical to this, except for slight differences in how Wait, the which metal is. Which mark is that one? Which mark is that one? This one is the Mark V. Mark V. And so they were using the Mark V around when the war broke out already. I mean, they had. Yeah, the Mark V was adopted basically the year before the war broke out. Now, the Mark IV looks identical, it just has a slightly narrower cylinder. It's these little incremental improvements, excuse me, incremental improvements that you see in the British system so that it advances the Mark system. But basically, pre-war Webleys are gonna look like this for the most part, that's not a hard rule. And there's a wide variety of where these were issued to police forces and different units with different slight changes to them. So don't sweat the details. Um, what would happen though during the war is that they would swap this out for the Mark VI, which actually harkens back to the earlier Mark I in that we have this much uh, larger sort of uh, elbow shaped with a wide bell grip Mark VI revolver. Now this is less convenient to carry, but if we take a closer look, we get a much larger barrel. We have a much more pronounced grip. This thing is designed uh, for actually target shooting. And I don't mean casual target shooting, I mean, 
aiming and firing more consistently. And it, it, to be fair, you have to understand this is a strong decision because obviously this takes up a little bit more metal per gun. They felt like they needed this upgrade. Now, uh, one disadvantage to this gun is that working from a large caliber like 455, the gun itself is very large and awkward. And then there's a tendency in training to anticipate the recoil and other problems like that. The British after the war would move away and go to a 38 caliber revolver for ease of training. So these are not the simplest pistols of the war. They're heavy hitting, they're six shot, uh, they're certainly reliable, but uh, you know, if you're sitting at this and going, yeah, I, I deeply prefer this over a seven shot 32 ACP, well, you might if you took the time to practice. If you hadn't taken that time though, the 32 ACP might be a little bit easier for you to use right out the gate with less training. When did the uh, when did the Mark I actually come out? I mean, how old was this whole Webley series? There's an interesting exchange of Webley ideas. Webley did a good, the Webley company as it was, and it's changed names, it's been Webley Scott after some partnerships and stuff, but turning the clock back, Webley did a really good job of collaborating with other inventors. So you see things like Webley Greens and Webley Prize and stuff like that. Um, this particular gun builds on other concepts already present in Webley, other concepts in other guns, but it turns up for British service about 1886, but it's not officially adopted until some years later. That doesn't mean they weren't already in inventory right away. So this is a right at the tail end of the black powder age revolver that has then made it into the smokeless era pretty significantly. Like you don't see this getting replaced until the 20s. Now, these guys, both of them combined, are definitely icons of the First World War. Um, I don't know that anybody doesn't recognize them at this point if you're familiar with British equipment at all. And like I said, this is a very shallow perspective on these guns. They deserve a lot better and we will be giving them a full rundown with accessories and other things. Uh, I know a lot of people are probably wondering why I don't have a Pritchard bayonet on this because that's one of the most infamous things with the Mark VI is that commercially made bayonet that you could get for the end of it. Those did not appear until I believe 1916, maybe early 1917. Um, and realistically, you didn't see them widely dispersed. Not a lot of people were taking the time to put a bolt-on bayonet onto their revolver and then somehow find a way to carry it that way or quickly attach it. Like, it's it's it captivates the imagination. I doubt it was a regular occurrence. And the originals are quite rare and small in number. The reproductions, however, are incredibly numerous because it is such an icon. Now, Britain wasn't married specifically to the revolver, although we will see, for those of you who are sort of firearms history buffs, that they're gonna stay with the revolver all the way through World War II for the most part. That doesn't mean they didn't experiment with other things though. So one of the most interesting things that's gonna come out of Britain just before the war is this the Webley self-loading pistol. This particular one is a Mark I naval. Uh, they would also have one for the horse artillery. That one's much more rare, much harder to get a hold of, uh, but that has an adjustable rear sight and it could take a shoulder stock. We're gonna stick with the one that we were able to get and take a closer look. So uh, with this guy, it's a semi-automatic pistol. It feeds from a very large boxy magazine so that it can work through and this is a hand reload of ours. It took some work to get these set up so that we could shoot this gun, but we have now. Uh, the episode is forthcoming. But that is a large cartridge and a large single stack magazine in order to handle it. And somewhat interestingly, while we're talking about this magazine, is that it has requested by the Navy, mind you, two positions so that if you secure it on the first click, it becomes a single loading gun. And after every time you fire, she'll lock open, and then you can toss another loose round in there and closer and shoot again. So presumably this is for safety on the target range or some other weird form of convenience that we're not familiar with anymore today. But for me, honestly, when I was playing with it, I found it just to be sort of troublesome because you had to make very sure that you drove that all the way in to the actual firing position. Uh, the magazine release, by the way, is on the bottom and is a push button. The thing has a grip safety, so you have to grip the gun in order to then pull the trigger and drop the hammer. Uh, this gun is very interesting in that it uses a sort of shelf, top shelf lock system, which means the bearing surface for the lock just is on the top of the slide. This system, for those of you who are familiar with modern handguns, is very popular now today, which is that you just have the barrel move up and down, and then the, the, the barrel slash chamber area locks into the slide, and that's where you get your locking surface. It's extremely simple because it doesn't add any additional locking components that part of this gun still carries on today. The rest of this, however, as you can tell, is just 
grossly over proportion. I mean, I have large hands as it is for, you know, comparison to World War I, but this is a big gun. This almost outweighs a 1911, and in some proportions is definitely bigger. Uh, and again, still as big as all this is, it's still just a single stack pistol. Now, these things were not super common in the war. You're looking at seven, 8,000 for the most part, right from the get-go. Now these would be issued mostly in terms of what we're looking at possible combat or usage in battle. You're gonna look at things like uh, Naval Marines. You're gonna look at things like uh, Naval uh, Pilots. And then the horse artillery, like I said, had their own version that was almost, it's almost completely parallel to that Luger LP-08 that we've talked about before because it was meant for the artillery and then it kept getting snatched by pilots because they really liked that particular gun with the detachable stock and they would even go so far as to make a 20 round magazine for the pilot's version and that would be one of the early air pistols of the war. And by the way, this gun and the revolvers, they're all pushing that large bore, slow moving cartridge. So it's a heavy hitter, but trying to adapt it for something like you know air to air combat, I doubt there were many easy strikes with something like this. I mean. It would have to catch up the plane first. So uh, with those out of the way, I just want to mention a couple without going into too much detail because there's more room to talk about these things in other episodes. Like this, this, this shouldn't be considered core to just, you know, Great Britain. So um, one thing Britain did is that they would buy from the US. So you have things like the New Century, which is essentially the same as the Smith & Wesson 1917 revolver. This is all Smith & Wesson's large frame uh, military style revolver. Here, let me get this closer in. And again, for those of you who are familiar with US stuff, this just looks like a nice big, you know, 1917 style Smith & Wesson. Well, this one is chambered in 455, and these would be purchased by, say, Canada and Britain, and these would see service in the war. However, I really rather get into detail on this particular design when we're talking about the US, because it's really centered on US design. And then another thing that would be drawn into the war, because Britain was desperate for material, would be Spanish-made handguns. Let me tell you, it was a boom industry for them. This particular gun is another, well, this gun is like a Smith & Wesson number three clone. So this is almost like a latter day cowboy revolver that was duplicated. And because it was so compatible with large bore, it was popular for certain countries to purchase. So you're gonna see things like, Bulgaria is gonna get some in 44 Russian. You're gonna see uh, Italy get them in 1035 Bodeo. Uh, and you remember the Bodeo from our previous Italian episode, same cartridge, the Italians would use this. And then the British were able to get it in 455. This particular example is not a British issue, but we can take a look just to get an idea of what we're dealing with. Uh, you've got a pinch and pull top break, which is delightful, but still simultaneous eject. And generally the workmanship was better than you would think. However, they were not made to last over, you know, the decades, so a lot of these are in pretty rough shape today. But this is the same general pattern as any of them. This one in particular is in 44 Russian, but you could have this, most commonly you're gonna see 44 Russian, uh, Italian Bodeo cartridges, or British 455. We're gonna get into these separately. I would recommend at some point that we have a sit down and just talk about Spanish weapons once I've got enough of them in house, because it's fascinating how many things were imported to which countries during the conflict. Yeah, if you're on the Entente side, you're probably buying something Spanish short of the US. But uh, again, they worked. Uh, they were kept in inventory post-war for a while. They weren't the favorite revolver by any means, but just like with the French, they were there and they went bang. And they certainly hit where you pointed, assuming that you could read these tiny little sights on this thing. So, you know, gift horse in the mouth. But I think with this, we've pretty much wrapped up our pistols. Um, and I'm trying to keep it light and easy so that this can get shortened up for a good edited show. But if you'd like to know any more about those pistols, by all means, give us a shout out over at CN Arsenal. And speaking of Greece, if you'd like to see our special episode about Greece before and during the First World War, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and check us out on Instagram and Flo will make all of your little happinesses and dreams come true. I've said dreams come true before and people have complained, but he really will. See you next time.